thank you, uh, thank you, everyone, for joining us for the final uh, final panel of the uh, of the OSL Digital Asset Capital Introduction Conference. Um, apologies for the slight delay. We, uh, we we were just getting the panel together and having a, a quick uh, a quick debrief. So thank you for for bearing with us. Um, as we've wanted to do today is to uh, as we as we keep saying, sort of connect allocators of capital with ways to invest into digital assets and. One of the key thematics and key things that um, that that, uh, that allocators are thinking about as they go into markets, well, two, two things really. Number one, um, are my funds safe? You know, are my funds safe with how I allocate and how I safe keep my assets? Number two, what is the regulatory environment in which I'm investing and my counterparts are are, are uh, within that envelope? So the final panel today, we've we've brought together, I, I guess, some. Some very significant names from the world of uh, of digital asset and finance, in order to uh, to broach the topic around the evolution of digital asset cu uh, custody, security, and regulation. Um, I will stop, and I'm going to uh, pass to uh, to each of uh, each of our panelists to uh, to give ninety seconds on on themselves uh, and on their firm. And um, uh, Max, you're top left on the uh, on the screen, so you get the pleasure of uh, of being first out of the blocks, mate. That's great. <laughs> Thanks, Matt. Hi, everyone. Uh, so, uh, as a, as a as a short intro, so I, I run uh, Zodia. Zodia is, uh, I'd say, the newest addition to to the crypto custody uh, uh, set of players. Uh, we are we are a subsidiary of Standard Chartered Group. And I'm sure all of you would be very familiar with that. Uh, we were born out of the innovation arm of Standard Chartered, but very much leveraging the group's sort of experience in in in, in traditional custody. Really, uh, I personally have spent 15 years with Standard Chartered across multiple geographies. Um, what, what what I think is worth noting is we we announced back in December the uh, the uh, the investment by Northern Trust. Uh, we took a stake into 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 our company, and I think. Uh, uh, Mainly the reason behind that was that they were sharing the vision we were trying to come to market with, which is really using traditional custody and, and applying it to, to, to digital assets. Um, Zodia is a, is a UK-based uh, UK based entity. Uh, we're in the final leg of uh, getting uh, you know, the registration with the FCA. Uh, big topic for the next set of questions, as Matt, Matt mentioned, on the regulatory framework. Uh, and we should be going to market uh, in the next couple of months. The bet is on Q2. Back to you, Matt. Cheers, Max. Uh, Daniel, you're next around the clock. Hi, uh, I, I'm Daniel. Um, I look after business and listing in the DBS exchange. Uh, the DBS Digital Exchange is 90% uh, owned by uh, DBS and 10% owned by SGX. Our custody services uh, remains within the traditional bank. Uh, it sits within our traditional custodian. Uh, so, um, you know, the same people that provides the custody for your equities and, and, and fixed income, etc., are the same unit that's actually uh, providing digital asset custody. So, so um, we, we, we feel like by, by providing that kind of uh, institutional uh, service, we can have like a one-stop custodian service for all your assets. Uh, hand it over back to you, Matt. Cheers, Daniel. Thank you. Uh, Henry. First of all, yeah, guys, good, good to be here. You're saying 90 seconds. Normally, I do it in 60 seconds, but uh, <laughs> appreciate it. Uh, very, very excited to be here. And thank you for OSL in the, in, uh, for making this possible. Also, to all the attendees who've been uh, listening today this, uh, to all this session. Uh, my name is Henry Arsley, and really my passion, my focus on life is the future of finance and the future of money. I do this wearing many, many different hats. One of them is at PwC, where I run a global crypto team. Uh, we have uh, over 200 people across 20 countries. We have done over 400 crypto engagements in the last 36 months. Uh, so very focused on that and obviously very do a lot of work with custodians, banks, getting crypto investors, uh, regulators, central banks, and so on and so forth. My second big hat is obviously uh, on an on a academic perspective. I'm a, a junk professor at University of Hong Kong, where I've been teaching crypto and fintech uh, for many, many years now. And of course, then there's my other hat, which is as an author writer, like my last book on the future of finance and many others. 
And my fourth hat is probably more on a policy making side. Uh, I sit on a number of advisory boards of regulators, central banks, and try to educate uh, the broader public, uh, mainly by my social media videos that many people know, including my show called The Crypto Capsule and my weekly newsletter called The Future of Money on LinkedIn and Twitter. So great to be with you on that. Look forward to sharing with you all today about the exciting world of crypto custody. Terrific, Henry. Thanks. That was 80 seconds. Well done. <laughs> <laughs> Right, uh, Gavin, over to you, please, next. Yeah, thanks for putting me right after Henry. I feel so depressed now. <laughs> <laughs> My life is so boring. <laughs> so, <laughs> good afternoon. So I'm a partner in the investment funds team at, at Simmons & Simmons in Hong Kong. Uh, and my focus on private fund formation and, and, you know, Hong Kong regulations, mainly helping a lot of startup managers, uh, you know, get their licenses and launch their funds. So about four years ago, uh, you know, I started getting into the area of crypto funds. And these are mostly structured as open-ended hedge funds, no, usually Cayman, uh, and investing into crypto as a novel asset class. Um, since then, you know, we've done a lot of interesting work. I mean, we, we helped the Diginex guys uh, get their Type 9 license for uh, a crypto fund of funds, and we helped them launch their Cayman SPC. Uh, and after that, we helped the Kinetic guys structure their fund, you know, and then getting the SFC on board initially with the total return swap structure. Um, you know, a lot of the discussions that we had with the SFC during this process uh, helped shave, shape and evolve their thinking uh, for what was eventually what would eventually become the Type Nine virtual assets regime and also the Type One distribution regime. And I'll talk a bit about more uh, a bit about that a little later on. Um, and you know, finally helping the the venture smart guys get their first official Type Nine virtual assets license in Hong Kong. So that was very exciting stuff. It's groundbreaking stuff for Hong Kong. So nowadays, you know, I'm very busy with uh, with Type 9 applications. A lot of managers wanting to get this virtual assets license. I think I have like five or six on the go. Uh, we also continue to help managers launch fund structures, investing into crypto funds. You know, and, and the, the jurisdictions now range from Cayman to BVI. Uh, there are people talking about using a Hong Kong LPF and also Hong Kong Unit Trust. So, you know, in a nutshell, that's pretty much what I've been doing. Terrific. Thanks, Matt. Terrific, mate. Thank you very much. All right. So I think that I think the message is we're in very we're in very safe hands with the with the panel that we've got and the discussion that we want to have around uh, around custody, security, and regulation. So let's um let's kick off with regulation. Um, I think as as we've as we've as we've looked across the the growth of digital asset markets, um, regulatory clarity has been one of the the key um key requirements to foster the the broader and institutional adoption of the asset class. Um, I guess the question is, you know, where are we now? You know, when we when we talk about regulation, where are we on that uh, on that journey to uh, to a regulated market? Um, Gavin, as the uh, as the lawyer in the room, why don't, we, uh, why don't we start with you? Yeah, thanks, Matt. So, you know, four, four years ago, Hong Kong didn't have any regulations around around crypto assets. I mean, Bitcoin and Ethereum uh, and other utility tokens were not considered securities. And the SFC didn't consider any of this was actually within its remit. So when we first helped Kinetic uh, put together their, their Bitcoin tracker fund, for example, we actually had to create synthetic security over the BTC uh, by way of a total return swap. So the SFC could then, you know, take jurisdiction over the fund. The SFC has come a long way towards creating a framework for crypto regulations. And, you know, to their credit, you know, they have done so rather quickly. Uh, but I would say this framework is still piecemeal in that there are separate regimes for different types of regulated activity, but no overarching set of principles that would govern across the various areas. So, you know, um, if I'll, I'll just take you through a whirlwind tour of this. What are these various areas of regulation? Well, first, in relation to defining whether virtual assets fall within securities, uh, at the Securities and Futures Framework, I, I would say around September 2017, the SFC issued a statement on initial coin offerings. And the SFC basically said, you know, digital tokens are prima facie virtual commodities and are therefore not securities. But the final analysis is determined by the types of rights and interests that these tokens ultimately represent and give to their holders. So while the SFC made clear that Bitcoin and Ethereum are not regarded as securities under the SFO, um, whether other types of tokens and virtual assets are securities would require a deep dive into their specific features and characteristics. So, you know, on a, on a daily basis, both the Hong Kong team and the Singapore team would give uh, opinions to a lot of managers as to whether their tokens are actually securities or not under their respective jurisdictions and the regulations there. 
In December 2017, the SFC followed up with a circular to the effect that Bitcoin futures are, however, regulated as futures contracts under Type 2 of the SFO. So next, in relation to asset management, uh, prior to any formal regime being created by the SFC, uh, we helped the guys at Diginex obtain a Type 9 license, and I mentioned this, for managing uh, their, the, uh, the first fund of crypto funds in Hong Kong. And we also helped them create and launch that fund. Now, this was a halfway house, and it was an ordinary Type 9 license, but with special conditions imposed by the SFC. And, you know, these were conditions in relation to things like the, the methodology for selection of the underlying funds, the investment process, portfolio monitoring, uh, how they were going to do due diligence on the underlying funds and the type of tokens that were traded by the underlying funds, as well as, you know, cybersecurity and, and custody. Following from that, in, in, in November 2018, the SFC announced its formal Type 9 virtual assets regime, and this is for the management of virtual assets funds. So if you're a startup manager and what you're managing does not amount to securities, the position remains in Hong Kong that you don't need to have a Type 9 um, license to manage that fund in Hong Kong. However, you can choose to opt in to the regime by applying for a Type 9 and then agreeing to an uplift, right, which is the imposition of additional conditions on your license. These conditions would cover such things as, you know, your, your organization, your structure, who, what is the bench of the staff that actually have VA experience, what is your fund structure, you know, how do you go about constructing your portfolio, what types of coins or tokens are you going to be investing in, what are your fund terms, what your fund, your, your expenses, your fees, national investors will be allowed in these funds, so absolutely no retail funds, that rules out ETFs, uh, what are your audit processes, your risk management and your cybersecurity processes. Yeah. Yeah. Now, now, for an existing Type 9 manager that wants to manage more than 10% of gross asset value uh, in virtual assets, it is, however, compulsory for you to get this uplift. So you need to go to the SFC to revisit your license. After yeah. asset management, then came, then came uh, distribution. Uh, so at the same time as the Type 9 regime was announced in November 2018, the SFC published a circular for the distribution of virtual asset funds. So these are Type 1 managers seeking to distribute virtual asset funds. Now, although this was not a consent or application procedure, the circular set out various compliance standards the SFC expected for these regulated entities uh, before they would be allowed to distribute. So they had to, first of all, undertake to only sell to professional investors. They had to set out to the SFC what the suitability requirements would be. They had to ensure that there was in-depth DD on the underlying fund managers, you know. Yeah. And they had to disclose all these risk factors to clients. Yeah, yeah. And I was going to say, I, was say, I mean, we... Um, at, at, at OSL, obviously, we've seen the the rigor, um, yep. you know, through our Type One and our Type Seven license under, yep. the, under the SFC. We've seen the um, we've seen the rigor that uh, that is applied, um, which you know is a was a which is a great result, and which ultimately you know investors uh, and allocators you know uh, can look to. I yep. suppose, what what if we think about you know throw over to Max? What about I mean, what one I guess one of the things that we see is differential treatment globally. Uh, and somewhat still sort of fragmented treatment globally with respect to regs. Max, do you want to give give a view on, on how you're seeing it? It's very fragmented. So I'm less familiar with, with Asia, obviously, a lot more familiar with, with Europe and, and, and North America. Uh, broadly speaking, every country has its own set of regulation from, I would say, nothing at all. Like, I guess, what you mentioned about Hong Kong a few years ago, most countries have typically sort of applied the MLD5, so Money Laundering Directive 5, and set minimum standards when it comes to AML and compliance. And then on the, I would, well, I shouldn't say extreme side, but, you know, the complete opposite, you have, you have countries like Germany who have a full-fledged license issued by Baffin. You have the New York DFS that has the bit license, and that obviously is fully regulated entities. But if you think about the U.S., it's state by state. Right, so you have <clears throat> sorry California on one hand, which doesn't necessarily need uh, have a license, and New York on the other. So very complex uh, reg environment. I think the other thing which is very interesting when 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 we look at custody is cross border services, right? So you know for us out of the UK, where can we uh, service client from? Uh, so if you have a Cayman fund, if you have a California fund or a German fund or client, and I think that is becoming even more complex because the rule around cross-border marketing and services need to also come into the mix uh, to see whether your custodian is actually eligible to service you and whether they have the, the, the proper you know licenses or registration to do so. 
and okay, flicking then to Daniel. I mean, Daniel, you know, you guys are in a pretty unique position, um, and, and Singapore is obviously evolving very, very quickly uh, with respect to the um, to the governance and uh, and regulatory framework. So could you give us a, a view with respect to how you're seeing it? No, well, I, I think that the regulations is evolving very quickly. Like, you, you know, when, when the Payment Services Act first came out in Singapore, it doesn't even cover uh, custody, right, for for digital payment tokens, right? Um, it, it was mostly just to cover, like, uh, money laundering and technology risk. Um, but very quickly, you can see the regulators actually put together an amendment to the bill. Uh, that was actually passed through Parliament uh, earlier this year, and that would actually cover things like you know facilitating transmission of DPT from one account to another, and that includes also the custody services of DPT, right? So now, now even uh, digital custodians would actually fall under the Payment Services Act when these amendments come uh, come into effect. I mean, it has been passed in Parliament, but they have not been actually come into effect yet right so I, I think in singapore they also make it quite clear uh in, in terms of the digital assets uh category so you have the asset backed tokens that were fall under the security futures act and then you have the um sort of the more utility uh, tokens and, and and the more uh the, the utility tokens that is like nobody space right and then you have the cryptocurrencies that fall under digital payment tokens right yeah. so i think the act becomes a lot give us a lot more clarity so we know what to do so like um for, for example like in, in our exchange, uh, we, are, we have already got in principle uh, approval for, recognize, for a recognized market operator license, and we are expecting the license pretty soon. Uh, the, 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 the reason for that is uh, we, the, the exchange need to also fall under the Security Futures Act uh, for the issuance of any tokens that has exact uh, asset backing. Yeah. So if let's say I were to issue a, a token that's backed by equity, that's backed by fixed income, we would then need uh, it to fall under Securities Futures Act. But I think that it's, the, the act is sort of clear enough to know what we should do. Um, yeah. So um, by, by having that, you would say that um, someone that's offering custody in, in, in this space, if you're going to do a, a cryptocurrency uh, custody, it falls under... Uh, the, the the digital payment tokens um, and and the payment services act at least uh, the, the, you know that 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 would be the case when the new amendments of the the, the act come into place yeah. and then if you're going to do a tokens on let's say on uh, that that is backed by some sort of asset uh, or backed by uh, equity fixed income real assets uh, it will then fall under security futures act uh, then then you are required to have some sort of a, a capital market services license uh, to provide that exempted from this, the, the, the CMS license. Okay. So, um, but I think the, the, the good thing is that it's clear enough for us to know what to do. Okay. Right? okay. I mean, of course, the devil's are in the details. That's why people like Gavin gets, uh, you know, we need to get, get advice. Like, we, we still need to get a lot of uh, legal advice on exactly how to exit. Let me go this way. So I'm, let, let's say I'm a, I'm a CIO of, of, a, of a pension or an insurer and I'm sitting back and I'm listening to this conversation and my head's starting to explode. How do I find my way through this, this regulatory framework? Henry, how, I mean, how do you think um, investors and allocators are, are mapping their way through sort of this, this, although significantly increased clarity, but the fragmented uh, regulatory framework? Yeah, good question. Matt. Uh, frankly, I think from uh, the, the, the regulatory question, the custody question is one factor among many other things that uh, any allocator is looking at, right? Uh, I would argue actually from a custody perspective, Yes, we don't have, again, homogeneity when it comes to uh, regulatory clarity, but the real question is, does it really matter? If you think about a traditional financial space, most hedge funds are, are papered with their prime broker or in their, their brokerage, which often they're in London or in their New York, depending where they're based, and they're able to be serviced globally. So I think for a lot of the custodians, that, like, including the, the Zodia, the, the DBS, and, uh, and uh, OSL here, as long as in their home jurisdiction, they're, they're, they're properly regulated and they're able to service customers, I think that's, that's fine. One thing I mentioned also depends on the type of investor you are. If you're a corporate, you're looking for your treasury perspective or your crypto hedge fund that is trading the top 50 names, for example, uh, you know, a lot of these large institutional grade custodians will be actually quite, 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 quite uh, sufficient. But I think then the questions you need to ask is actually go more in depth as part of your operational due diligence. 
What are the policies, procedures these firms are having? Do they have the SOC reports that they're needing? Do they have the cybersecurity, all these different kind of independent reviews and, and so on and so forth? As part of that matrix, your operational diligence selection process, these are the questions that will come up. And if you're a fund manager, these are questions that will come up from the, in the ODD that your end investors are doing to you. I think it also depends on the type of uh, uh, fund, let's say, you're investing in. I'll give you a very simple example. Today, depending on what data you look at, about half of the crypto hedge funds in the market are quant crypto hedge funds. Quant crypto hedge funds, they don't even need a custodian. Actually, a lot of their assets are directly with the crypto exchanges. In those cases, actually, their counterparty risk policies how they're made a bit like in 2008, what we had with prime brokerage in the good old hedge fund world becomes even more important probably than even their custodian selection. So I think these are the things I think we really need to look at. And also, let's say if you're investing in an early stage crypto fund, a fund that is investing in what we call, you know, in SAFTs or the equivalent of safes in the equity world, very early stage tokens, which the reality is most custodians will not cover yet, then there's a potentially need for them to actually self-custody. So I think really these are some of the considerations you need to look at if you're an allocator and if you're a fund manager because of the, these are the questions you'll get from your end investors. Okay, so let's, Henry, let's, let's stay with you. And now that we're going down the custody uh, rabbit hole, what, I mean, what, what is custody? Um, and I think that's something that... Uh, you know, we, we, we all know what it is in traditional markets, but when we yeah. when we move to digital markets, what I mean, what what is custody? And we'll go around and, and let's get a view from everyone. What's important here? What is custody? Sure, happy to happy to kick off. Obviously, in the traditional market, there was this whole you know separation between safekeeping and custody, right? But let's say if we focus on custody, where you're holding clients' assets in trust, or you know it's part it's not part of your assets in the event of a of an insolvency or bankruptcy or whatever situation you're facing like that. Uh, you know, again, if we if we put my professor hat on for a second, there's really a couple of types of custody in the crypto space that we see, right? The one is obviously the kind of the third party, independent, institutional grade custody that we're seeing right now, the one that OSL, uh, DBS, and uh, the likes of Zodia and many others uh, will, will provide and will provide, which, by the way, is a space I think will experience a lot of growth uh, over the next couple of years. And I also expect a lot of m a in that sector as well. Uh, there's great firms like, uh, DB, like DBS, like, uh, like uh, um, uh, Standard Charter, who have been making the inroads in the space. I think there's a lot of independent players that I expect them to be acquired by some of the other second banks who have not been as fast of it. So I think there's a, that, that kind of market that exists that is actually very impressive right now. Uh, second, obviously, then you have a lot of these exchanges that also offer custody services. Uh, these are obviously for a lot of retail, you know, investors or individuals are investing. And you leave when you leave your assets with the crypto exchange. Is that a real custody? Uh, probably not. It's a debate that we can have. But at least these exchanges are kind of safe be- keeping your assets uh, from that perspective. And there's obviously a lot of questions on counterparty risk and so on and so forth that open up in such discussions. And of course, the last but not least is kind of the self-custody where, uh, you know, where the whole uh, OG mantra of the crypto ecosystem where if it's not your keys, uh, it's not your coins, uh, where they would love to have their, their coins with them, which works well if you're an individual trader or, you know, or an individual investor, which makes it very difficult if you're a crypto fund for one very simple reason that Gavin touched upon earlier is that for most licensed fund managers right now, you have a licensing condition that tells you you're not allowed to hold client assets which de facto means you're not able to actually custody them. And obviously, there's a lot of details here as well. But I think these are the three main categories. Again, I'm generalizing. There's a lot of details here. But uh, when it comes to crypto custody uh, from a macro perspective. Terrific. All right. Let's, Max, go up. Uh, let's go up your way. What, uh, no, you? Henry, you, you're absolutely right. Custody means everything, right? Anything from I have a ledger wallet, <laughs> right? I have my own custody to I have an actual custodian. Uh, and, and I think, we, I, I guess, when you, when, you, when you look at custody, you think about what you actually need. So prop trader requirements would be very different from you know, me launching an ETF. Um, and, and I think, fundamentally speaking, for us at least, custody is, is relatively straightforward. You take the client, client asset rules, you know, the UK CAS or the 17F5 in the US, you look at the principles, and you apply them to digital assets. And that evolves around compliance, around governance, around risk management, around what we call market access, but in this case is you know, access to, to, to the various chains and, and, and the, the, the technical ability to, to connect with these networks. So, so, but that's more on the, I would say, the regulated side of things. Now, what's very interesting in, in, in the type of product as well you're in, right? So, so if you launch an ETF, and, and we've seen some, some, some tries in, in, in Canada, 
and I think now Australia has sort of opened up the door for, for, for ETFs, is the regulator forces you to go back to, I would say, the traditional definition of custody and actually pushing custodian to fit into what a traditional custodian is supposed to meet in terms of requirements. So you can, you can make your own definition of custody anywhere from self-hosted wallets and just purely just managing your private key to having a regulated uh, custodian that actually takes the responsibility and the liability uh, very much like a traditional custodian would. Daniel, go, go, go your way. I, I would think that, you know, if you look at how custody is developing this space now, it's very similar to equity in 1980s. In 1980s, you can start to see that there were a lot of people that traded shares, let's say, in, in, in Singapore, Malaysia, that actually kept scripts. So th there were a lot of uh, mom and pops who were actually trading counters and actually kept paper scripts, right? And then eventually uh, what happens is that in the late 80s, uh, more and more brokerage were uh, saying that we could keep that for you. And then you, you start to keep your scripts with a brokerage, right? So uh, your, your broker would keep it to you, very similar to like your exchange uh, keeping it. And then uh, it, it got dematerialized and people wanted a more institutional grade. As more institution went to the space, you, you, were, you were looking for institutional grade uh, uh, custodians and the banks start providing that service where, where you have formal statements on what you hold and stuff like that. And, and I, I think it's developing that way, right? Uh, you, you have various types of ways of keeping it. You, you, you can have your own personal wallets keeping it now. But I, I think as um, this space become more institutionalized, as you start to see uh, more institutional products, unit trust type product, uh, whether it's ETF, ETP, ETNs, kind of stuff that, that is being developed in this space, you will start to see a move towards a more institutional grade type uh, custodians. Uh, people would need to uh, see that, you know, the, the trust element becomes like paramount important and, and you will need to actually keep it with some sort of uh, an institution. And, and I think that that's the way we'll start uh, to move, like how, how, how it did in, in, in traditional assets. Terrific, terrific. Guys, I'm looking at the time. Because we're a little late starting, we might sort of run over a little bit if that, uh, if that suits everyone. Has anyone got a hard stop at, uh, at one, at, 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 in three minutes that we need to be aware of? No? All right. We'll, uh, we'll keep... Oh, well done. <laughs> All right, so let's, let's, let's look forward. Let's look forward. Gavin, where, I mean, where, where are we looking forward to then with regulation? You know, we've sort of established where we're at now. Um, where, where, what we think of custody now, where, where do we think, you know, how is evolution of, of regulation going to, uh, to move forward from here? Yeah, so, um, so basically I covered the main areas where there are regulations at the moment. The, the last part of that regulation was obviously the type one and the type seven for virtual asset trading platforms, which OSL has, and you know, you guys are the first ones to get that. So, you know, congrats on that one. Um, in terms of where there are still gaps, I would say there is still, you know, no regime to cover crypto trading, so non-securities trading, uh, and there's there's no regulations covering advisory, so crypto advisory. So this that, that's type one and the type four. There's also nothing covering lending at the moment in terms of crypto. Uh, what do we see on the horizon? I think uh, inevitably the definition of securities under the SFO is going to be tinkered with. Uh, it will probably be extended to cover virtual assets. And I believe this is necessary uh, for two reasons. The first is to cover the existing gaps, which, you know, those two areas that I just mentioned. And the second is to align the existing tax regime under the Inland Revenue Ordinance uh, with the regulatory position. Because at the moment, we have this weird situation in Hong Kong where you can get the Type 9 license to manage a crypto fund, but your fund's not going to be tax exempt under the unified funds exemption regime. So we're going to need to get alignment of that, of those two things. Finally, I think that, you know, though, and this has been in the works for quite a while, they're, they're, they've been talking about, you know, introducing a structured product regime uh, to cover derivatives. And, and I think uh, that this is going to also have a, an impact on, on uh, crypto options swaps and other kind of synthetics that are built around cryptos. Uh, and so I think these are the two main areas that's going to impact the virtual assets world. Okay, terrific. Um, let's, uh, should we talk FATF and travel rule? Max, do you want to, uh, do you want to take us away there? What, how's that going to, how, how's that going to define the industry over the next one, two, three years? Uh, well, it's a uh, it's a very sensitive topic because I'm seeing to the market, right? And maybe for for context, 
the travel rule just mandates that you know beneficiary and remittance information is shared between between VAS, the virtual asset service provider. You know, call it a custodian, call it an exchange that offers custody, etc. Uh, I think the rule is the, 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 the you know the rule is good in nature. Uh, practically, in its implementation, it has proven to be very very difficult. Uh, we've been at it for maybe a year, year and a half. Uh, we've joined, you know, a few working groups because I think there is what I'm aware of three or four initiatives trying to reach a standard. I think GDF has done a good job with the uh, IVMS 101, setting standards for data that needs to be exchanged. Uh, you know, I know OSL uh, is very active with us in the travel rule protocol group, which is, I would say, mainly for non-US fast. The US got their own uh, initiative. The, the main issue I force is there is no interoperability right now across this working group. Everybody's trying to, you know, get them connected because ultimately uh, these networks will have to form one at some stage or work with one another. Uh, number two, the interpretation of the what it means in the various jurisdiction is again very fragmented. So if you're in Switzerland, you don't have the same data requirement than if you are in Hong Kong, than if you are in the US, than if you are in the UK. And, and I think that makes the whole implementation of it extremely complicated. Uh, and, and the industry really needs to work together uh, to, to make sure that we come up with a system that doesn't end up with a multiple sets of protocols and technology integration, but actually uh, looks more like something which is more unified, if you like. And, and that would be for the, for the greater good of everyone. Uh, but right now we are... <laughs> couple of months if not years away from from reaching that stage changing gears again eye on the clock so what 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 am i looking at i'm a cio again what what specifically what dd am i doing what am i when it comes to regulation and custody and where we're at right now if i'm as i said i'm, I'm, the, I'm the ceo of, of, a, of a pension or a uh, an endowment or, or a large family what uh, what DD am I doing on my um, on my service provider as, as a custodian? Do you want to uh, you want to kick it off, Henry? Sure, always happy to. Yeah, I think if you're a CIO, I think the as before, especially with our pension, which is quite a big high bar, you know, or anybody in a, in an allocator perspective, if you're looking at allocating in the sector, obviously you're gonna have a lot of scrutiny. The one thing I think you need to be really sure that it's actually solid is the operation due diligence side. When it comes to your custodians. Uh, what I often recommend to a lot of these allocators is really to make sure you're documenting the process. Why you chose a certain custodian, there should be a framework you're using where you compare different providers and you look at different options and why you come up to a certain... So there's a methodology in it. You just didn't choose one because you felt like it or, you know, you have pints with the, with the, with the, with the, the guys there on, on, on Fridays, right? So there needs to be a process in the same way that any you would choose any other service provider. The one thing I would say, the couple of things you need to look at as well as a part of the assets you want to start trading, it's also what you want to do with it. We're seeing many allocators now look at potential yield enhancement solutions, right? Lending, borrowing. So you need to make sure that some of the providers you're looking have these options. And also then you need to also make sure that a part of the regulations, uh, a lot of these, how are these um, uh, custodians are tackling some of the, uh, again, the operational issues internally. It's boring. It's not sexy. But these are the questions will come up, you know, okay, what are the SOC reviews? What are the security reviews they've done? What are the processes? And so on and so forth that these firms have done. Because the last thing you want to do, is after the hours and hours you spent as an allocator to confirm the invest to convince the investment committee to allocate a ticket into crypto, you get actually veto on the ODD side. And thankfully, now in 2021, we have providers, including the many of the guys that are on the panel, including OSL and others that are on the chat as well. Uh, you know that, that enable institutional investors to access the asset class, which was not possible two three years ago, by the way. And I think that's one thing. As long as you take the right steps, now you should be able to get a tick from the ODD side and be able yeah. to allocate uh, from the from an investment perspective without any concerns on the operational due diligence side. Terrific. Daniel, what um what are you seeing? You know, when, when when you're when you're talking to clients, I mean what's top of mind for them with respect to, to process? Uh, I, I mean if you're talking about um uh, you, you know, things like asset managers, traditional asset managers that want to go into this space. One way they're looking at it is like coming to our ecosystem uh, was, was fiat currency, and then they'll buy from our ecosystem and then store with us. So with that, they don't even, they, they don't have any effect, any problems about transfer ins and stuff like that. Uh, but uh, for those that want to uh, say they work with other exchanges and want to do transfer in, we would then have to work with that those VASP. So let's say, for example, they buy an OSL and they want to transfer in. Then uh, 
our custodian will have some sort of agreement with OSL, even if we don't have uh, an automated process to share the information required for travel rule, we can do that manually. We can do it over email, we can do it over that. Uh, but we, uh, as long as that, that uh, the necessary information is shared, we can still take in uh, those assets. So uh, we, we are still working around it. It's a very tedious, difficult process because currently um, it's, it's, it's manual. And uh, so, so we, we are still working with uh, different vendors and, and, and um, you know, to, to look for a solution. We, we don't have an ideal solution yet. I don't think anyone does, uh, but, but uh, that is something that uh, we are putting a lot of effort into. All right, uh, let's, uh, let's start thinking about bringing it to, to a close. Um, I guess last, uh, just go around the room. Last, uh, last comments uh, from from everyone. You know, let, let's think of back to, back to the. Uh, I guess the the content of, of this panel and and what we've seen today. I guess you know what key, final key things that uh, or key messages that uh, you know each of you would call out with respect to regulation or custody. Um, you know, when we think about allocating and. Uh, and those that are making decisions to move into the asset class, Gavin, do you want to kick off? Uh, kick off with you. If we if we give everyone sixty seconds, we're going to hit exactly two o'clock. So how? <laughs> No, I, I think uh, I think developments in this space is on the regulation side at least is, uh, are very exciting, uh, especially uh, you know with the SFC. I think they take they've made great strides in terms of understanding the space and understanding the product, uh, and I think um, you know in the next. I would say two, three years, we're going to see the entire framework getting filled out. Uh, and I think that's a good thing because at the end of the day, uh, why, are we, why are we doing all this, right? It's really to get access to the fiat and, and to get access to, you know, the, 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 the cold hard cash. And, and you need the regulations as, as the conduit between your space and, you know, the traditional finance space. And so I think that, you know, if there's a lot of activity and there's a lot of building out and there's a lot of learning going on, um, uh, that, that will only benefit everyone in the ecosystem. Terrific. Max? Yeah, so purely on the topic of custody, right? If you were, I mean, on selections, etc., it's essentially a matter of who you are and your appetite to risk, right? If you're a prop trader, it's very different than if you want to launch a regulated product like a, like an ETP, an ETN, ETF, etc. It's a matter of where you are, where you're launching that product, the geography, and who can actually provide you services. It's a matter of the product you're launching as well. And and you know, I think now you have a wide range of of, of custody solutions and a custody with you know taking that term very very broad uh, from self custody all the way to I would say highly regulated. Uh, providers. So I think it's good. It's good for the industry that you do have that choice. Uh, are we seeing, you know, that 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 broad range uh, continue? Uh, I guess the, the last piece I would say is the selling point as well, right? If you're a fund manager, who do you want to have on your prospectus? And it's not just about custody. It's also about fund, fund administration and things like that. And there is potentially, especially as we go into sort of mass retail uh, there is clearly an appetite for having more regulated custodian uh, to be named in this prospectus to give the market comfort and to, to provide some, I would say, comfort to the general public that, you know, these assets are, are in, in, safe, in safe hands. So, yeah, I think there's more for everyone right now, which is uh, very positive. Terrific. Daniel, final, uh, final words? No, actually, what what I have is, is more questions that I wanted to, to ask Gavin. Uh, is it, it, you know, in terms of like investors protection, right? You know, a lot of regulators when it comes to uh, uh, cryptocurrencies and digital payment tokens and stuff like that, they, they have certain regulations uh, on it in terms of money laundering and stuff like that. But the, not many of them are actually covering it from an investor's uh, protection perspective. You, you know, what, what, what do you think from that, from, uh, you know, from a global perspective? Uh, how do you think regulators will move in terms of investor's protection? Well, so it, it kind of differs in terms of the attitude from jurisdiction to jurisdiction. I think in Hong Kong, especially the SFC is very conservative about this. So, for example, they've, they've made it clear that, you know, retail products are not going to be on the horizon, I don't think. And, and, and so in, in terms of, for example, people who are allowed on the trading platforms, people who are allowed to invest in funds, the SFC has drawn the line and said only professional investors, right? And so, so 
when when they when they import all of the rules around professional investors into the regime, then you know things like uh, suitability, uh, things like AML KYC, all those standards are already there, right? And so that is where the SFC is going in terms of investor protection. But but just keep in mind that this is professional investors only. It's not retail, which means that actually the the level yeah. of of oversight and and the level of handholding is going to be lower. Because at the end of the day, the assumption, the base assumption is that these guys are all, you know, sophisticated investors. Terrific. Yeah. All right. yeah. Last, uh, last words, Henry, for you. Yeah. To close it off, guys, just on the custody side, three, three things that I'm watching over the coming months. First of all, there's going to be increased competition. We're seeing not only the big banks in the space, but there's a lot of also independent players. I see Hex Trust is on the, on the chat, for example. I think this is going to drown, drive down a lot of the fees in crypto custody. Second thing that I'm watching is obviously what's going to happen with a lot of the kind of ancillary services the, from basic custody to offer lending, borrowing, yield and enhancement solutions, I think will become very interesting to see how that evolves. And number three, I'm really watching more consolidation in the sector. And our last crypto hedge fund report, I think the, high, the custodian with the highest market share was 15%. So I think I expect to see a lot more consolidation in the market. There'll be a lot of M&A from banks who are a bit late to the game, acquiring independent players, and also more just uh, activity in the sector. So very exciting space. Custody may be boring. It's not sexy, but it's definitely a very core part of the, of the crypto ecosystem. So I'll sign off with that. So thank you very much, uh, Matt, on that. It was a pleasure sharing with you all today. Guys, thank you. Thank you all very much for joining the, uh, the panel. Um, it, uh, it, it, in fact, brings to a close the, uh, the entire conference. So I might just take the floor for, uh, for another couple of minutes to thank everyone for, for joining us today. Um, you know, we've, uh, we're really delighted to, um, I guess, to be able to bring a capital introduction service uh, into the digital asset industry and, in fact, run the industry's first conference in bringing together allocators of capital from, as we've said, from sovereigns to families uh, to, to wealth managers, corporates, um, and, and kits um, in, in various different methodologies, either directly into into cash markets through through funds, and we introduced to, you know we introduced everyone to a uh, to a broad range of funds. You know how uh, how how futures are, are evolving and regulated futures markets with the with the CME, and then uh, and then obviously closed out with uh, you know with this star started panel talking about something that's just top of mind for, for all major investors and that's safekeeping of, of assets and custody. So look, we, we really want to thank everyone for, for attending today. We're really delighted that you uh, that you could attend. Um, if you have any follow-up questions, if you need introductions to any of the panelists or keynotes, please reach out either directly if you've got the details or to, to someone here at OSL and we will uh, we will connect you in. Um, and with that, we'll, uh, we'll call it to a close and uh, with with a little bit of luck, we might be able to do some of this uh, in a, you know in an analog sense the next time we uh, we get together. So thank you everyone for for joining, and we'll uh, we'll call it a close there. Cheers. Thank you. Right.